Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Have your attention, please. All quiet, please. Thank you. All right. So we've got our uh, last presentation <clears throat> today. And then uh, next week, you've got um, finals. So in here, it's going to be uh, essay assessments. And we'll get those to you soon. So you'll be able to use your notes from the last um, uh, two units. And yeah, and get those in by next week. So um, have your uh, notes out, your packet out. Um, we're on the last page, political parties. Let's get right to it, shall we? There we go, political parties. All right, so here's the deal about uh, political parties. You've got major political parties and then you've got minor political parties, and then you've got people who aren't in political parties whatsoever. All right, so here's what you need to know about political parties. The major ones, the successful ones that have been around for a long time, tend to be very broad. Make sure you have that. The goal is to win elections. Now, they do want to have people within the party that are going to help them to win elections and so forth. Um, so it's not all about, you know, purity, um, you know, I believe in this, and anybody that doesn't believe in the same thing I believe in, then you're out of my party. Well, you know, you're not going to too many elections because it's going to be a fairly narrow group. So you're going to have all these various different coalitions that are forming up. Interestingly enough, George Washington, first president of the United States, didn't really like political parties. He, he, he called them factions, and it's like, oh, they get in the way, but they tend to occur. People form up in factions, cliques, groups. They try to move forward their goals. Um, and so even during the time of the George Washington administration, um, there were political parties beginning to be formed in his cabinet among his top officers. On the one hand, you had John Adams and Alexander Hamilton that sort of saw things one way, and on the other hand, you had Thomas Jefferson and others that are seeing, seeing things a little bit differently. So, you know, too bad, George Washington. You didn't want uh, political parties, but we got political parties. So we're going to be spending a lot of time uh, here today talking about political parties. And then we'll also look at the big event for political parties every four years a presidential election every two years an election um and so let's get right to it all right so here we go um your very first political parties as i mentioned uh, started forming up during the time of george washington's administration and they're going to come to be known ultimately as the federalists and then the democrats although as you can see from the handout the original name for the Democrats was the Republicans. Isn't that confusing? Because eventually there will be a Republican Party, but not yet. Um, and then they'll be referred to, uh, or actually before that, as the Anti-Federalists, whatever. And then the Democratic Republicans, and then finally, just simply as Democrats. Okay. So probably one of the most important uh, divisions between those two is the 1800 election, right? You have Thomas Jefferson, okay? going up against his buddy, John Adams. Right? John Adams was the uh, vice president under Washington and then became president. He was serving for four years. And in 1800, Thomas Jefferson was like, yeah, well, you know what? I'm going to run against you. And so they had that election and there you go. There's the electoral uh, college vote, right? These were the only states back in those days, Kentucky, Tennessee, right? Vermont had come in. Oh, Massachusetts, that's also included in Maine. Anyway, so you got the electoral vote. Um, he needed a majority and he got a majority there and Thomas Jefferson was elected as the president of the United States. Here are the Federalists in the early times. They tended to be, you know, more in favor of a stronger national government. There you've got um, uh, Alexander Hamilton, um, more business oriented and so forth, um, as opposed to Thomas Jefferson and what would become known as the Democratic Party. They tended to be more focused on rural interests, um, Although over time, there, I mean, we see this, this is gonna happen. Big parties kind of shift over time. So some of the things that the Democratic Party was in favor of way back when, not so much today. Similarly, you're gonna see various different shifts. One thing you can count on with major political parties, if they wanna be successful, they'll move with the times, they'll shift and adapt and maintain some popularity. Otherwise, they're out of there. Because there have been some major political parties that have been out of there. Like, the Federalist Party, they're gone. And then another party, the Whig Party, you're like, what the heck, the Whig Party? Well, when the Federalists kind of like put it away, especially after more people got a chance to vote, more men, because uh, the, property, the property qualification went away. And so the Democrats uh, really tapped into a lot of the poor white vote. Um, you know, as the Whigs are like, oh, 
okay? It's the Federalists, excuse me, they're gone, and the Whigs come in, and, and the Whigs are there for a while, and they're the major opposition party, although the Democrats are very, very strong. But even they, the Whigs, tend to peter out, um, like it says right there, what, no broken promises since 1857? There's your last Whig president, Millard Fillmore. I don't even remember, that was, he was before Lincoln. That's for darn sure. And then, um, you know, of course, from the ashes, from the remnants of a major party that's broken up, the Federalists, the Whigs. The Whigs, what's the next party going to be? Well, there you go, the Republican Party. They get started up their first successful presidential races in 1860. Some of you guys remember that from last year in ninth grade world history, um, where Abraham Lincoln and the Republicans won. What were their big issues? Stopping the expansion of slavery. And then eventually they were all about like, let's stop slavery, keep the union together and stop slavery. Very, very interesting. Over time, is that, I mean, is that an important issue for the Republican Party today? Uh, no, slavery is not there as much anymore. And as we saw last time when we were talking about the civil rights movement, which party, Republican or Democrat, was like moving along with the civil rights movement? They kind of both were. Although, you know, we did see some Southern Democratic governors and so forth that were like against it. Although we saw some uh, uh, Democratic presidents, Kennedy, Johnson, who were in favor ultimately of the civil rights movement. So um, there you have it. The Republican Party and the Democrat Party have been the two major parties since that election in 1860. And no candidate outside the Republican Party or the Democratic Party has won the presidency since that time. So they've done some things to maintain um, their position, all right? Including moving with the time, shifting, dropping certain issues. If some of the new party comes along, we'll see that. You know, then the Republican Democrat parties might just kind of like, hey, that's a nice issue. Take it. All right. So um, pause for a moment. Who the heck is Thomas Nass? What is he, presidential candidate? No, he's a cartoonist. Um, he was doing cartoons in the late 1800s, and uh, he was the one who actually uh, ascribed the mascots to the polit particular political parties, right? They're Harper's Weekly national uh, magazine and he's the cartoonist and here he is portraying the democratic party as an animal as a donkey or an ass and there he is portraying the republican party as an elephant interesting thomas nass came up with those but curiously enough the republicans and democrats have kept those as their mascots they didn't really you know i mean eventually they're like i mean the republicans are like it's big and bold and strong is the elephant. All the Dem Democrats say, yeah, your elephant. Anyway, you know, and of course the donkey, you know, the Democrats are like stalwart and hardworking. And of course the Republicans are like, ah, yeah, your mouse got some ass. So anyway, but whatever. Oh, by the way, did you know Thomas Nast invented the Santa Claus too? <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was, he was the cartoonist that did this one. And, and I don't know, the, it looks a little bit different than Santa Claus, but it was one of the early renditions of Santa Claus that started to kind of stick around. So yeah, Santa Claus is support good behavior and giveaways. Right, there we go. Okay, so moving on. I want to talk about um, the various different um, political parties, and you get a little bit of a sense of kind of where they're at um, over the years, over the last hundred years or so, based on who the presidents are. Um, so I found that I've got two different pictures I'm going to be sharing with this. This is a cartoon picture you can see here of some of the Democratic presidents. We've got Andrew Jackson right here, and then Woodrow Wilson, and then you've got Dwight D. Eisenhower, Harry Truman. Let's see where who we're going to next. Ah, yes, Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, Bill Clinton, oh, excuse me, Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, and Barack Obama, all right? So let's go through and say a few things, take some notes on the, uh, uh, the Democratic uh, uh, candidates, excuse me, presidents as we go through here. Obviously, we got Andrew Jackson, seventh president. Just a couple things about him. Just as a reminder, oh, look, he's got the $20 bill. Oh, yeah, remember that from last year? Trail of Tears. Uh, Indian removal. Not as popular now as he was then, but he was one of the first, like, very common men who was elected to, uh, as president of the United States and had a common touch, uh, common upbringing, and so forth. And was very, very popular, elected twice. Oh, excuse me. There we go. Now we're going into the 20th century. We got Woodrow Wilson. You see the dates on him, 1913 to 1921. You guys can learn a lot more about Woodrow Wilson next year in your junior year, you know, and <laughs> be history. Woodrow Wilson, it's interesting because he's not like, oh, Mr. Civil Rights. In fact, he was a racist. 
but he was uh, involved during his time period. World War I was going on, so it was a big thing going on during his presidency. Um, tried to keep out of World War I, but the United States is like, you know, the Germans kept sinking our, sub, or kept sinking our ships and so forth because we we're trading with the British and French. And so you have the British and the French and the Italians here. And there's Woodrow Wilson attending the Paris Peace Conference that ultimately resolved and decided what the terms of, uh, of the resolution, the ending of World War I were going to be. Very, very interesting, controversial thing and so forth. As it turns out, Woodrow Wilson would end his presidency after World War I, and there'll be a bunch of Republicans um, coming in there. We'll check on those guys later on. But then during the Republican administration, boom, economic depression. That's not good for a political party when an economic depression starts during your time period and it doesn't seem to get fixed. So what happens? Mm, sorry, Republicans, you get another Democratic president. And this is Franklin D. Roosevelt, the 32nd president. He's the only one who was elected more than twice. Okay, and he ran four times and was elected four times. He was the president during the Great Depression. Did the economy turn around during the Great Depression? No, but he did a lot of like uh, speeches and radio things to try and keep kind of calm uh, the people during that time of crisis. He also instituted, make sure you write these down, uh, and got Congress to support the Social Security um, law to provide for protection. Um, World War II got started during his time period. And um, yeah, so the United States was very, very much involved. And you can see here he is at the Yalta conference uh, meeting with uh, President, uh, the British Prime Minister, as well as the Soviet leader, there's Winston Churchill, and there's the Soviet leader, Joseph Stalin, remember him? Um, hang on just a sec. Okay, yeah, sorry for the pause there. Uh, but yeah, so he ultimately died during uh, the time uh, of an office. It really wrecked him. He was in a wheelchair before he became president uh, from polio as an adult, young adult, and uh, ultimately died before World War II was over. Um, and he will be replaced by his vice president, Harry Truman. There we go. There's Harry Truman with President, excuse me, Prime Minister uh, Churchill from Britain, and there's Stalin again. And this is like after the war is over in Europe. And so the Potsdam Conference, Harry Truman is going to be given the responsibility of like ending the war for the United States against Japan. He didn't know about nuclear weapons. Hey, Harry Truman, we've developed nuclear weapons. Whoa, what are you going to do with them? He uses them against Japan. Japan's out of the war. He will also be involved in uh, the Cold War. Uh, so quite a few of these presidents, as we go into the uh, latter part of the 20th century, are going to be involved in the Cold War, which is this conflict we talked about before. The United States and the Salas versus the Soviet Union and their client states and tension and all kinds of various different things going on and some particular wars that break out. For example, during Truman's time, a war breaks out in Korea. North Korea invades South Korea. The United States and others try to push North Korea back. Big fighting going on in uh, Korea. So that's going on during the time of President Truman. Notice this, during the Cold War, who, Republicans or Democrats, are like for winning the Cold War and against the spread of communism? Pretty much both. I mean, they're both going to be saying, we're tougher, we're tougher, we're tougher. So there's going to be a competition among Republicans and Democrats during the Cold War. Um, let's see, Harry Truman is going to be followed by a Republican for, for eight years. We'll get to Eisenhower later on. And then another Democrat. We see this kind of swing back and forth and so forth. John F. Kennedy, during the Cold War, tough Cold War uh, president, uh, tangles with the, uh, the Soviets during the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Soviets put <laughs> forward base missiles in Cuba <laughs> with nuclear warheads, and we're like, you can't do that. We surround Cuba with ships and say, get them out of there, and it almost comes to like 1962 came on the television to tell the Americans that uh, we're in a very difficult situation. Thankfully, the Soviets moved them out of Cuba. Yay. And we moved our nuclear missiles out of Turkey. And we also promised that we weren't going to invade Cuba again. But anyway, um, 
And so there is one interesting thing. He was involved actually in a tax cut. Usually you think of Republican presidents in, in doing that sort of thing. Sometimes when the politics are right and you're like, hey, this is good for getting elected and this is good for what we think is good for the country. And so John F. Kennedy is involved in a tax cut. Again, usually you think of Republican presidents, but sometimes you get Democrat presidents to look around and they size things up and go, this is what we're gonna do, okay? We know, of course, that his presidency ended with his assassination. And then, of course, you had Lyndon Johnson coming in and finishing Kennedy's term and then getting elected for a four-year term in his own right. So many different things going on during Johnson's time. Oh, my gosh. The Cold War is going on, right? The Vietnam War is percolating up, and the United States is making more efforts in there. Johnson expands um, government as far as, like, social policies, the um, Medicare, health care for the elderly, Medicaid, health care for the poor civil rights bill, the Voting Rights Act, and so forth. All of these things are coming in during the time period, although he didn't run again in 1968 because the Vietnam War was going on and it was like, it was becoming, starting to become quite unpopular at that time. And Johnson was like, I'm out of here. So he finished up his term and moved on. Then we got another couple of Republicans, Nixon and Ford. And we'll get back to those guys, but here we go. There's Jimmy Carter, also president during the Cold War time. He has some difficulties. The economy isn't doing so great during his presidency, the latter part of the 70s. And we get into a tangle with Iran, which is really a mess because the Iranians allow for and take control of the U.S. embassy in Iran, and they hold our embassy personnel hostage all that time. It's just a mess. There's President Carter coming on the television to tell the Americans what he's going to do about it. And Ultimately, the Iranians did not hand the Americans back over until the day that the next president actually came into office, which is going to be Reagan. So we got Reagan followed by a Bush, okay? And then we got another Democratic president. Here's Bill Clinton. Hmm, you've seen that picture before. Bill Clinton's an interesting one because uh, politics were much more conservative, you know, under, under Reagan and Bush. And, and Bill Clinton, he actually reduced the size of government in the sense that he reduced some of the welfare programs that we had in this country, some programs that provide for various different people who are unemployed, you know, limited benefits and so forth. That was kind of where things went. As an interesting sign, things have turned more to the left, more liberal in the Democratic Party since President Clinton. So, for example, when his wife Hillary Clinton was running for president last time, her positions actually were a bit different than her husband's were during the time of his presidency politics and viewpoints shift a little bit over time. So if you want to be successful, you do kind of sometimes shift your politics and positions. Obviously, you know, um, he had an impeachment crisis, the whole Monica Lewinsky thing, but did was he impeached? Yes. Was he removed from office by the Senate? No. Okay. Was he followed by uh, another Democrat in office? No. You're going to have a Republican coming in. And then you get this sort of back and forth and back and forth. And so you get the other Bush, and then now we, and then you move on to Barack Obama, the first African American elected president. Of course, with Clinton and Obama, this is after the Cold War, so you've got other various different things going on. Um, as you'll see, by the time Obama uh, takes over as president, uh, there's going to be two wars. We're going to be fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq, and his big priority is getting the Affordable Care Act, which is an expansion of Medicare, Medicaid, or Medicaid, excuse me and uh, various different uh, government health programs and so forth. And so there he is signing the uh, Affordable Care Act with his vice president, Joe Biden, there with him, and Nancy Pelosi, who was the Speaker of the House, and is again, and so forth. So yeah, that was the last uh, Democratic president um, that we've had in this country, Barack Obama, 44th president. Now the Republican presidents, right? And of course, the first Republican president was Abraham Lincoln, right? 16th president of the United States. And let's see if we can follow through. We got an interesting picture here. We're going to have Teddy Roosevelt. We'll talk about him. And then it's going to be a while before we're going to have another Republican president. Uh, or, or well, maybe that'll be three. And then we'll go to Eisenhower. Okay. And then we'll go with Nixon and Ford. We'll go with Reagan and Bush and Bush. And this was done before uh, Trump became president. All right. So. There we go, Teddy Roosevelt, right? Speaking from the bully pulpit, he was an interesting one. Actually, some Democrats today look back and go, ah, Teddy Roosevelt would have been a really good president. I kind of liked him. Um, what were some of the things that Teddy Roosevelt was involved in? Business regulations, the government, or the businesses were so big. And he was like, man, maybe we need to regulate those guys a little bit because they're too powerful. He 
also instituted um, and expanded the National Parks uh, Service. And so, yeah, he was very, very involved, very dynamic person. As it turns out, and you'll learn a little bit more about this, quite a bit more next year. Um, he was followed by his buddy, William Howard Taft, although after Taft came in, Roosevelt was like, actually, I don't think you're very good, and he ran against him. The 26th president of the United States ran against the 27th president of the United States, and neither of them won. The 28th president, of course, is Wilson. We got him there. And Taft was much, much happier. There he is in the middle as the chief justice of the United States Supreme Court. That's how he finished his service to the United States of America. Yeah, Taft, and of course, after Taft came Wilson during World War I. And then after World War I, you had a series of three presidents. I won't talk too much about them, but you know, we had the Roaring Twenties. Economy's great. Yeah. Oh, they also had the Spanish flu. But the economy rebounded in the 20s uh, during the time of Harding, who died mysteriously and was replaced by his vice president, Calvin Coolidge. And then he was replaced by Herbert Hoover and things are going great. And then we hit the Great Depression in 1929. And during Hoover's time, it didn't look like the country was doing enough for the government. There was a sense. And so Hoover ran for election and he got defeated. I mean, the Republicans took it in the chin and the Democrats won the presidency. Franklin Roosevelt, and they got control of the House and Senate, and they put in all kinds of various different programs um, to expand government involvement in, uh, the, you know, in retirement, Social Security, and unemployment benefits, and all kinds of various different things. So when will the Republicans come back? I mean, actually, what are they? Lo they lost like the next five presidential elections. That's a long span. It's not going to come back until after. World War II. And you got your World War II hero, General Eisenhower, who's going to be running very much as a moderate Republican. And he comes in during the Cold War, 34th president, and says, I'm going to go to Korea. The Korean War had already started, and he's going to ultimately cut a deal to, um, you know, basically stop the Korean War. No winners, but just stop it. You know, the boundary is still north and south and the demilitarized zone. So there we'll have Dwight Eisenhower. Did his vice president, Richard Nixon, take his place? No. After Eisenhower was there for eight years, you'll have Kennedy, then you'll have Johnson, and Richard Nixon will make a comeback in 1968. 37th president of the United States. Still very, very tough on the Cold War. Fascinating person. Very, very fascinating. Manages to triangulate in foreign policy and ultimately do deals with the Soviets as well as the communist Chinese so that they're kind of at odds against each other. Very smart, although he's undone by the Watergate situation, right? Some people in his administration like break into the Democratic headquarters and Watergate Hotel in Washington, D.C., and then there's a cover-up and then there's an investigation and there's impeachment proceedings in the House of Representatives. And before the House of Representatives can impeach him, he quits and he resigns. There he is doing his last goodbye as he gets on the helicopter Marine Corps One to leave the White House lawn and go into, I don't know, go into what? <laughs> he could still be facing federal criminal charges, but his vice president, now president, Gerald Ford, pardoned Nixon. There he is on television explaining why he wants the whole thing over. Although there were enough voters out there when Gerald Ford ran for president in his own right, said, mm, nope, so Jimmy Carter came in. Gerald Ford did not have, was not elected as a president. After Jimmy Carter is um, out, actually Jimmy Carter loses an election um, effort against Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, very conservative, very conservative, like with so many of the other Republican Democrat, very tough on communism, and he'll be there. There he is speaking at the Berlin Wall, saying, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall, spending on military, spending on all kinds of various different things. But ultimately, toward the end of his eight-year term, he is getting along with the Soviets because we know this. We already covered this at the early part of the year. The Soviets are having changes themselves. Gorbachev is instituting like democracy and free speech, and capitalism, and things like that. And the Cold War winds down during the time of Ronald Reagan and will finish officially in the next president, George H.W. Bush. Right. So he is the president during the transition from going into the Cold War to this post-Cold War, like what could happen in the post-Cold War? Well, I'll tell you one thing that happened during the post-Cold War, Iraq took over its neighbor, Kuwait, and there's George W. Bush getting, excuse me, George H. W. Bush, uh, dad to George W. Bush, getting on the television and telling the American people, say, hey, you know, we need to go up against Iraq and, and get them out of Kuwait, and that's exactly what happened. George H. W. Bush. 
although, you know, very, very popular. But then people were like, what'd you do for me lately? I mean, he was very popular in the early part of 1991, but in 1992 is when the presidential election is going. And what's the economy like in 1992? Eh, not as great as it really could be. And that hurts Bush. And so he's defeated by Clinton, who gets elected for eight years. And then, of course, all the things going on with Clinton. Looks like the country is ready for another Bush. Close election. Here comes George W. Bush, number 43. So we got Bush, Clinton, Bush, right? And during the Bush administration, we're going to go to war with Afghanistan. You guys remember why? What happened so that we were like, man, so mad at Afghanistan? What were they like, doing training camps? Yeah, they were doing training camps. For who? Al-Qaeda? Who's that? Osama bin Laden? What are they? Oh, 9-11. Mm, not good. So 9-11. President Bush, with the support of a lot of other countries, Democrats and Congress and so forth, send in troops to Afghanistan. Throw out the government there, although it's not all tidied up and the war has gone on and on and on since 2001. There will be another war in Iraq and we will overthrow Saddam Hussein, the same guy that, that uh, tangled with George H.W. Bush. This time, uh, Saddam Hussein is going to be thrown out, and President Bush will be like, can we get a new government in Iraq that will work with us and so forth? Anyway, very, very interesting time period during the eight years of President uh, George W. Bush, although it ended with the economy kind of going down, and that made it kind of hard for another Republican to come in. And so then you get Barack Obama coming in, and he's going to be in there for eight years. So who's next? Is there another Republican? Yes, there is. There we got the current president, uh, Donald Trump, Republican. He wins a Republican nomination. And he's got Republican uh, majorities initially in the House and the Senate. Tax cuts, make sure you have that down. Tax cuts was a big key thing that he got through. And of course, now he's dealing with the COVID-19 uh, uh, challenge, which is ongoing, which is why I'm actually doing this video instead of standing in front of you and answering your questions as you raise your hands. How long will Donald Trump be president? Interesting question. How will the COVID-19 thing get sorted out? Good question. But it's happening during this time period, and it's a very, very big thing. So a lot of eyes are on the president of the United States, as well as Congress, as well as the governors, as well as like local leaders, as well as this local school boards, I mean, and as well as individuals, whether or not they do this or that or go there, or they, you know. Yeah. There you go. By the way, did you know what GOP was? That was an old term that was used a long time ago. Grand old party, the Republicans call themselves. So if you hear GOP, they're basically saying Republican Party. Okay, so just the Democrats don't have an acronym like that. Republicans do. Big whip. All right. Now, let's get into the other political parties. Let's look at some of the other political parties during our country's history. And we'll see, uh, tying into what I said earlier about if you want to be successful, you want to win elections, Republicans, Democrats, the two major parties, yes, stack the deck. I mean, they literally, make sure you write this down, they stack the deck. They write the rules to help out the major political parties. I'll show you this. And they're also, I mean, there's like in politics, they're kind of sneaky. Write this down. Once upon a time, there was a socialist party. There still is. The socialist party was actually doing pretty well in this country over 100 years ago. They were the first ones that came up with various different ideas, and they tried them out, and they're like, maybe we should have like, I don't know, like, minimum wage or like worker safety laws or like food safety laws or like m laws that make it safer for miners as in people that go in like coal mines and things like that and those ideas initially were like mm, i don't know that's too much government although socialist party candidates started winning elections and what happens if you start winning elections on new ideas proving that maybe those new ideas are starting to become popular the other parties take those ideas too. And then those other parties are like, don't waste your vote on the socialists. You know, oh, we'll get that done. We'll get that done. It's a wasted vote and so forth. So you got popular ideas, big parties can take them. So there you go. Socialist party is not nearly as, uh, as prominent as a third party as they were over 100 years ago. Okay. Uh, here's another example of a, a third party. In 1912, the Bull Moose Progressive Party. I mentioned to you about um, Teddy Roosevelt was president, and then he was followed by Taft as uh, uh, he was the next president. And there was a split in the Republican Party. Teddy Roosevelt wanted to be president again. Taft was like, no, I'm president. And so they fought it out within the Republican Party, and Taft ended up getting the nomination again in 1912. 
And Teddy Roosevelt, instead of saying, well done, I support you, you're the party nominee. He formed a third party, a splinter party. So make sure you have this. One type of third party is a splinter party where you basically have a the major party splintering into two, okay? So on the ballot in, in 1912, you had Taft, the president, Republican, Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, who went in with the Bull Moose Progressive Party, right? And then you had the Democrat candidate, Woodrow Wilson. Well, if you're a typical Republican voter, who are you going to go with? You're going to go with Roosevelt, you're going to go with Taft. They split. They split. You'll see that next year because they're going to be covering that again. And so well, Wilson came in first. I mean, he only had like, what, 40, 41, 42% of the popular vote, but he had a majority of the electoral vote. One thing about splinter parties, and this is typical, write this down. The people involved in splinter parties look and they go, wow, that argument really wasn't worth having because we lost. Maybe the next time we come together and the Republican Party did reform again. They didn't win in 1916, but by 1920, 24, 28, they will be winning those presidential elections, okay? There's another example, 1968. So you guys are a little bit more familiar with this. You see George Wallace right there, yeah, governor of Alabama. This is when he was still kind of a segregationist. Yeah, he was a segregationist in 1968. And he didn't like where the Democratic Party was going. Uh, you know, all these Democrats now are supporting like the Voting Rights Act and getting rid of segregation and so forth. So he ran as a, as a third party candidate and he actually carried some states in the South. Can you imagine that? Yeah. He got the electoral votes of a number of southern states, and the Democrats lost in 1968. Richard Nixon, Republican, was elected in a close election. Okay, so ultimately the Democrats come back together. Other third parties, and these ones have been around for quite some time. Libertarian Party. Uh, we talked about ideology earlier on, and this was a helpful one because the name Libertarian Party actually fits the ideology. They want what more government or less? A lot less, right? More individual freedoms or less individual, more individual freedoms, liberty, think of that. So Libertarian Party is interesting because sometimes the Libertarian Party, they tend to want less government. So it kind of lines up a little bit with the Republican Party somewhat there. Although, so some Libertarian type voters will look and go, oh, no, I don't necessarily want the Republican, but you know, I don't want that Democrats. So I want to vote for the Republican. Although, I don't know, it's very interesting. Keep an eye on that this year, right? In close presidential elections, sometimes these small third parties can make a difference. Just, if you haven't heard about this, some of you guys, I imagine I've heard this, others are like, who the heck is Justin Amash? I mean, what the heck is this guy? He's like a re Republican congressman. He was a Republican congressman from the state of Michigan. He's still in Congress. He was the one Republican in the House that voted for the impeachment of Trump. He's not running again for the House. He's announced he's going to run for president of the United States and get on the ballot as a libertarian candidate. And there's this big debate going on right now among various different people who care or pay attention. He's not going to win. People don't expect him to win. They don't expect him to get in first place in enough states to get him a majority of the electoral vote. But because he's on the ballot, Will that hurt Biden more, the Democrat, or will it hurt Trump more, the Republican? And I've heard arguments for both. Keep an eye on that. I'm sure you'll hear and discuss this a little bit more as we go into uh, November of this year, which is when the final general election is. The Green Party is another interesting one. The Green Party, um, they're very, very focused on environmental issues. Okay? And sometimes the Green Party members are like, you know, the Democrats aren't good enough on environmental issues. So... They have candidates running in 2016. Jill Stein ran as the Green Party candidate. I don't know if she got even close to 1% of the vote in any particular state, but I tell you what, Hillary Clinton supporters are like, man, I wish she wasn't on the ballot because in a close race, trying to get the electoral votes in a particular state, like, I don't know, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, or someplace, you know, if she wasn't on the ballot, maybe the people would go for the Democrat. In 2000, in a very close Bush-Gore race, there was a Green Party candidate named Ralph Nader, and oh my gosh, the Gore people, the Democrats were so mad. Nader was like, man, Gore's not good enough. And he got like two or three percent of the vote in some of the states, and Gore lost those states, and he lost the election. So anyway, keep a close eye. Sometimes those 
third party candidates in presidential elections can end up being a little bit of a spoiler. Probably the most prominent of third party or independent candidates in recent history occurred in 1992, where you had Ross Perot running. He ran as an independent that year and his big issue was balance the budget. Can you imagine the government spending a lot less money than they actually brought in in taxes? Anyway, the Republicans and Democrats didn't seem to be, according to him, doing enough on that issue. And so he ran and he started getting a lot of support, right? This was interesting. Take a look at this, right? So Perot ultimately got close to 19% of the popular vote, right? Clinton won, but he had only 43% of the popular vote and George H.W. Bush running for re-election got just a, what, 37 and a half. And that was a result. Perot didn't come in first in any state, so he didn't win any electoral votes in any state. Clinton came in first place in enough states that he won the majority of the electoral vote, but it was very interesting. Perot folks were like, oh my gosh, those Republicans and Democrats and the media people who support Republicans and Democrats kept saying that the pro voters were wasting their votes if they didn't vote for you know, Bush or you know, for Clinton or something. And so here was a poll that said results with pro voters that because of media bias voted for Clinton. So there is a show that pro would have come in a lot better. And then uh, those that were pro voters maybe stayed at home. You know, because they're like, ah, I'm not gonna waste my time. There's a lot of voters like that. I'm not gonna waste my time. My vote doesn't make any difference. So there was an argument. Yeah, maybe Perot would have done it. If he had, he would have been the first third party or independent candidate to come in first place and win the presidency since, I don't know. I mean, who was the last candidate that didn't have a political party? George Washington. So is that gonna happen this year? No, I think it's probably gonna be Republican or Democrat, okay? So, um, oh, I should have, I should have talked about this. Oh, independent candidates. I don't have a slide for that. I should have put a slide in there. Independent candidates, because like Ross Perot ran as an independent candidate, right? And there was a lot of attention. He was a very wealthy Texan. And so he was able to not only get a lot of attention, but spend a lot of money in his campaigns. But typically, if you're on the ballot as an independent candidate, I did that in what, 2002. A lot of people are like, I don't know what an independent stands for and so forth. A lot of voters are independent. They Probably a better thing is to say they swing or lean a little bit more to the Republican or lean a little bit more to the Democrat. They swing, they're independent that way. But an independent voter, do they vote for independent candidates? Not so much. Most independent voters ultimately ended up voting for Republican or Democrat or they don't vote. Okay, so when I ran as an independent candidate in 2002 for the uh, um, for a House seat in the Idaho legislature, it's like, oh wow, you know, I got the highest percentage of a third party or independent candidate running for the legislature in like modern history in Idaho. But I lost big time. <laughs> it's like 33% of the overall vote. So it's not likely that you are an independent candidate gonna gonna win. But who knows? You know, who knows? Parole almost did it. All right, next one. All right, you see where we are now here. Single member congressional districts versus proportional voting system. This is one of the ways that the Republicans and Democrats, the two major parties, make sure that the power stays to them, okay? By having pretty much all the races, all the races for the House, all the races for the Senate, pretty much all the races for all the state legislative positions, single member district. In other words, one person gets the seat. Well, what other way of doing it is there of doing it? Well, you could have what they do in many countries, including um, like in Germany and Israel and so forth. They have what is called proportional representation. So in other words, instead of having one member per district, they would have a district and they would have like 10 members. What? So how does that work? So you vote for the party, and then based on the percentage of votes that party gets, they get a percentage of those seats in that 10 member district. So let's just try it out for size. Let's say you had a 10 member district, okay? And, um, and the Republican party gets like 40%. So they get four of the seats and Democrat party gets 40%. So they get four of the seats. Oh wait, let's say the Libertarian party gets 10%. They get one. And uh, I don't know, the Green Party gets 10%, so they get one. So they actually get seats in that elected body. Instead of coming in second or third or whatever, 
they actually get some representation. What happens in those countries with proportional representation is like, for example, um, you might have, like here in Britain, they actually have single member districts, right? And so you've got the Tory party, which is the conservative party, Labour party, which is like, you know, the equivalent of the Democratic party. Whoever wins in first place gets that. But uh, if they instituted a proportional system into Britain, the other smaller parties, particularly this political party called the Liberal Democrats and so forth, they would actually do a lot better because they come in a strong second or strong third in many of those districts. Do you think the, what, the Labour and Tory parties are going to change the rules in Britain? Because it would hurt them. Are the Republicans and Democrats going to go away from a single member district? No, <laughs> no, we're not going to go to a proportional system. No. And in fact, even in Britain, you end up having all these coalitions that have to be formed. You know, one party will get like 49% of all the seats in the legislature. 49 is not a majority. So they have to make these coalitions with other smaller political parties. And yeah, so that doesn't happen in this country. Another thing that happens, uh, make sure you write this down. This is called gerrymandering. It's just this funky term that comes, it's been around a long, long time. In fact, this this map right here, right? This is part of uh, Massachusetts and it was named after, this map was named after a guy named Elbridge Jerry, was like an early politician there, who was drawing districts, these single member districts, right? And so he was drawing them in such a way, it was a really crazy looking thing. Look, he's got this like thing over Salisbury and Amesbury and Haverhill and I can't even name all those things and so forth. He puts them all together and creates this crazy looking district, which helps his party. That's the point, gerrymandering. You draw the lines to help your party. You create single member districts in a funky fashion to help your party, right? They call it like this crazy salamander gerrymander, okay? Basically, it's using drawing apparatus to help your party. So you wanna be the party that gets to do the drawing. So in many states, whoever is the majority in their legislature gets to do the drawing every 10 years. So every 10 years, we do a census, we count the people where they are, and then we move all the districts around so that you get a sort of an equivalence of people in each of the different districts, right? So like Idaho, for example, has grown in population, and, and uh, so there'll be some shifts and changes after the next census is finally done, or kind of slowed down right now. Let me just give you an example. These are some real districts. I think you can tell this one right in here, that's like for part of Northern Florida, I think this one is actually in North Carolina. But this is what a gerrymandered district looks like. So you got this crazy array. This is all one congressional district. And literally in some parts, it's like the width, the, 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 the width of the district is like the, the space between the yellow lines on a highway. I mean, it's crazy. The goal though is to put a lot of your, put, to, to configure it in such a way that you help your party and hurt the other party, okay? And you end up with some crazy things. Now. You want to give it a try? Want to give it a try? All right, take a look at this map. Look very carefully at the map. Here's what you see. I'll tell you what you see and then you figure this out, okay? You have to create six districts, okay? And they take political information of how people vote and the trends in the past and so forth. And they've discovered that in this entire area, state or whatever you have it, it's roughly equal. There are the Republican elephants and there are the, uh, in fact, it's exactly equal. How many Republican elephants do you got there? Let me see, 15. And they get 15 donkeys, all right? So you're gonna create six districts, right? And they're gonna need to be equal population. So you're gonna put five into each one. Well, you'd figure, you know, 50% are Democrats and 50% are Republican. When you do all the drawing and lines and everything, you're gonna have like what, three Republican majority districts and three Rep Democrat majority districts, all right? You know. But take a look, who do you suppose actually drew this one? Now you look down here, look at like district six down here. Like, whoa, is a Democrat gonna win in that district? <laughs> it's like almost all the voters there are Democrats. Yeah, Democrats gonna win there. What about in district five? Well, it looks like it's about 60%, three to two, 60% Republican. Looks like it might go to Republican. District four, same deal. Looks like it's probably gonna go to Republican. Oh. District three, wow, looks like it's gonna go to Republican. What did they do here? Two and one? The Republicans were the ones that made this map. 
And they drew it in such a way they crammed lots of Democrats into one district right here or a small number of districts. And then the other ones, they put just enough, a little bit more, like about 10, 20% more of their particular party people, which will give their Republican candidates a chance to win. So what is that legislature going to look like? It's going to be, you know, heavily Republican. This is party politics. This is, this is the way things work in America. Yeah, in Idaho, actually, I mean, it's a very Republican state, but we have a nonpartisan um, system set up every 10 years. You have three Republicans, three Democrats, they get together, they redraw the maps and so forth. And what they see is the most sensible thing. They try, I mean, they really are not doing crazy, like, you know, districts like that. So I don't know who came up with that plan. My brother did <laughs> when, when he was in the legislature. And uh, yeah, eventually it became law. So Idaho is one of the few states that has like this nonpartisan um, map making, redistricting that they do every 10 years. Okay. Now, um, political parties. Political parties have various different folks that are going to help out in elections. All right, so now we're moving, uh, we're continuing talking about politics, we're moving to the election system and so forth. These are going to be organizations that are around the whole time. And it's like, so you see like the Idaho Republican, there's the Idaho Republicans and the Dem Idaho Democratic Party, right? And you've got um, national party organizations, the Republican National Committee, there's the DNC, the Democratic National Committee. Let me tell you this. The main goal of these state and national organizations is to help their candidates win, okay? Now, when you got a bunch of Republicans running against each other, does the Republican National Committee get involved? Does the Rep Idaho Republican Party get involved? No. I mean, they're supposed to, and they generally leave it to those candidates, Republican candidates to sort it out and whoever comes up in first place, right? So, like, when Trump was one at running the first time, uh, the Republican National Committee was like, we're staying on the sideline until Trump got the nomination. And then they're like doing everything they can to help him and other Republicans win. The DNC was a little bit more, <laughs> Sanders felt like the DNC was actually helping out Hillary Clinton. Um, so this time they were being very, very careful, very, very careful to like not try to come favorable against Sanders or Ford, Biden or any of the other candidates and so forth. So I think they did a little bit better job. Uh, going through that this time around. Okay, so the main goal is to help their uh, party candidates to win election. Now, of course, the most important organization that you have for a candidate, like for example here, is the individual candidate campaign organization, right? They organize themselves, they've got the candidate, they're raising money, they've got the ideals and so forth. Who are they coordinating with? Yeah, who's Joe Biden coordinating with? DNC. If you go back to earlier slides we talked about, various interest groups that support him. So you got all these various different coalitions and different groups of people that are moving toward an objective, which is victory for your candidate, okay? So, and the same thing is going on on the Republican side. Way back when, 1972, we had the Committee for the Re-Election of the President, which <laughs> opponents were like, it's called Creep. Creepy title. This is before the Sunshine Laws, and literally there were people like, we like Nixon and we support him. Here, have a bag of cash. <laughs> Spend it on good things. And some of that cash ended up in the hands of like some of the Watergate break-in guys to help pay him off for their silence. I'm like, mm. So in the 1970s, after this whole Watergate thing, they instituted Sunshine Laws. Actually, my dad, when he was in Congress, uh, helped to play a role in getting Sunshine Laws so we can see how much is coming in and how much is being spent into the particular candidates' campaigns, right? You don't just drop off a bag of cash. And you can see that with the political parties as well. And remember, right, what is the limit on how much you, you know, some rich person can spend helping out some candidate they like in a political race? First Amendment, free speech, all the way. So, oh my gosh. Yeah, if you want to zoom in on this one, this is like how to become president of the United States, right? You know, this natural born citizen, you got to be 35 years of uh, age. You got to have be a U.S. resident for at least 14 years. Um, and so this is like the, the process, right? And this was actually pretty cool because we could see we were able to do a lot of this during this particular school year, right? We saw on the Republican side, for example, it's Trump. There were other candidates who were running other Republican candidates trying to get the Republican nomination, but it was Trump. Those other guys, like, maybe got one or two percent of the vote 
On the Democratic side, we had dozens and dozens of Democratic candidates in the primaries and caucuses, right? And they were engaged in debates and so forth um, in the early stages, and then ultimately the primaries and the caucuses, and then it's sort of its way. I remember that, right? I mean, it's like some of you guys are like, I don't know how Klobuchar is going to do, and, da -da -da -da, and all these various different things, and Buttigieg, you guys remember Buttigieg, and they got Warren, and, and was Bloomberg, you know, Mr. Rich, was he, was he going to uh, make a dent and get some victories and primaries and so forth? No, I mean, we ultimately, we saw it was Biden that was successful in the primary uh, and caucus system for the Democratic side. And of course, Trump had pretty much already wrapped up the, the, um, uh, the Republican side. Now, it's very interesting. We'll just throw this out there. I don't think this is going to happen, but who knows, right? On the Democrats, they have, um, you know, because the primaries and caucuses elect delegates to a convention, and then the convention does the, the nomination. So let me see. On the Republican side, we've got all Trump delegates, pretty much. On the Democratic side, you have lots and lots of Biden delegates. But they also have these things called superdelegates. In the old days, the superdelegates got to actually like cast votes. Who are they? On the Democratic side, it was like you had all these guys who were like party officials and elected officials and so forth. They just got to be a delegate just because they were part of the Democratic kind of party apparatus. And the Sanders people didn't get too much support from them in 2016 and they pushed real hard. And so in 2020, um, the new rules for those superdelegates is that, that they can't vote until like the second ballot. I'm not going to make really any difference this year unless something really weird happens between now and the Democratic National Convention. But anyway, Democrats do things a little bit differently than the Republicans. There is a difference. Uh, some of you guys, I remember explaining this to you before. Um, some states had a caucus, like Iowa had a caucus, longer, takes longer, right? You have discussions, you have meetings, you have, it could be some long, long meetings and so forth done by raising of hands and so forth. Primaries, most states do that. Idaho's doing that now. Um, and it's a lot quicker. You line up, you get your ballot, secret ballot, you punch it in, you leave, bye-bye. And then they all get added up, okay? So the purpose of caucuses and primaries is to select delegates for the national convention. There we go. We had debates beginning last summer and into the fall. And they actually were still participating in them even as the primaries and caucuses were going along. Let's see, oh yeah, and then the voting begins in early February. I see, can't really see that very well. Iowa, remember that? Iowa was first, then New Hampshire, then South Carolina, and then um, Nevada. Actually, Republicans did in South Carolina first. Nevada was first in, for the Democrats, and then South Carolina was the next one. Then you get Super Tuesday, right? Super Tuesday on the 20th. Did anyone get a victory, a big knockout win? Yeah, Biden did very well on that one. And those of you guys who put in and predicted that Biden was going to do well in many of those states ended up getting some extra points. Um, if you were thinking Sanders was going to do better, not too good. And Elizabeth Warren, I don't think she didn't do it. She didn't even carry her home state. Anyway, so knockout win pretty much for uh, Biden at that point. And then, of course, as we're moving along, it looks like Biden's pretty much got it wrapped up. Not quite, but Sanders... I mean, here's a picture, literally, I found this on the internet, and there he is, Bernie Sanders in his home, doing a quarantine announcement. After the quarantine came along, it was really hard for people to do any campaigning and so forth. Sanders finished his campaign. It's done, okay? It's done. Could anything else happen? Well, officially, the Democrats will select their nominee, July 13th <laughs> through 16th, 2020. This is what would have happened, say, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. You look at that, it's like, well, it looks pretty normal to me. You have a big party, you got all these candidates come and then and all these people and the news media and you get, you get a speech by the, the, the presidential nominee and then you get the vice presidential nominee. Don't know who that is yet. We'll find out. Biden has said it's, it's gonna be a woman, so we don't know who that is yet. This is not happening this year. Yeah, how can you do social distancing and so forth? They're gonna be doing something you got to do a convention. You got to have the nominee, but we already know pretty much who the nominee is going to be, unless something really weird happens. Okay. By the way, the Republicans, Charlotte, North Carolina, they were going to have theirs in August. Kind of doubt that's going to happen, but I don't know. Something is going to happen. Trump will get the nomination. Presumably, Pence will be the vice presidential nominee. And so we got both sides lined up. It's going to be one or the other, or I don't know, <laughs> or a mash. <laughs> What's going to be else is in there? How are they going to do debates? What are we going to like have two screens come up between the, with Trump and, and, and Biden? I mean, 
I don't know. It's going to be interesting. But those are important. Usually you have like about three presidential debates and then a debate among the two vice presidential candidates. Okay. I don't know how it's going to work out. <laughs> We're going to have an election. When are we going to have the election? Well, it's supposed to take place November 30th, November 3rd, excuse me, first Tuesday after the first Monday in the month of November. Here's a prediction, All right? This is looking at the electoral vote. Remember, Nebraska does theirs a little differently. So maybe Trump's predicted to get all of Nebraska except for like one electoral vote here. Same thing with Maine. Look at the swing states. There you go. You're going to be elected president of the United States. You need to do well in these swing states. I like how this map does it because they've got like the dark red is like strong or highly likely Republican and the dark blue is strong or highly likely Democrat. So you can see these numbers right in up here, right? And then you got the swing states. And some of the same swing states as we had last time, Wisconsin, very close election, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Florida, Keep an eye on New Hampshire, Maine, Arizona, right? And some of these light ones like North Carolina, Georgia, Iowa, Ohio, I would put that in a little bit lighter, but I don't know. I don't know. Colorado, New Mexico, Nevada is always a close one. Um, this one has it like uh, not really quite clear. That's one prediction. Here's another prediction, right? And literally it was like in 2000, remember Florida, if it hadn't gone for Bush, in a very close way, it would have you know, gone for Gore, and Gore would have been elected president. So just one state switching over. It's a lot, a lot of attention to that. Um, yeah, you'll have an opportunity to look at that as uh, the fall comes in and, and, and look at these predictions and make your prediction of your own. Who's going to win in each of these various different contests? And who will be ultimately then the next president of the United States? Because we need to have one. The Constitution says on January 20th, 2021. They're going to take the oath of office, right? Who's it going to be? Is it going to be Biden? I think it, how do we have Biden's picture doing the oath of office? That was when he was taking the oath of office as vice president uh, under Obama. And this is uh, the Trump one from the last time around. So which is it going to be? I don't know. You got any predictions? You got any favorites? I don't know. I'll tell you what. That is uh, that's going to wrap it up for us here on the notes for the politics uh, unit. And we'll get your essay questions coming up here real soon. So make sure you've got all your notes and you've covered all the material because you're going to need those as you do your essays. Okay. And if you have any questions, shoot me an email. Otherwise, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you.